It's January 23rd, 1909, just before 6 a.m. The RMS Republic is underway to the Mediterranean, having departed New York City the previous afternoon. Captain Inman Sealby sits on the bridge of his vessel, vigilant in a thick fog. Suddenly, a terrifying sound bellows out of the fog. A ship's oncoming horn. Sealby knows a collision in the fog could mean certain doom for his ship. The Republic responds to the mystery ship, and the two vessels exchange whistle blasts, hoping to avoid a collision. But the unknown ship plowed on, right into the side of Republic. A gash the size of a small house is opened in the Republic's hull, and part of her superstructure is ripped away. It does not take long for Sealby to know what is happening to his ship. Republic is sinking. At this point, it is a matter of hours before she is at the bottom of the ocean. The Republic, a White Star Line ship, was built in 1903 at the Harlan and Wolfe shipyards in Belfast. She was originally built for the Dominion Line and christened Columbus. Columbus was placed in the modest Liverpool to Boston route, stopping at Queenstown. She was a twin screw, four masted vessel sitting at 15,000 gross registered tons in a length of 570 feet. She had five passenger decks and was equipped with standard amenity for an ocean liner at the time, including electric light and refrigeration machinery for her galley. First and second class each held approximately 250 passengers at capacity, while her steerage could hold up to 2,300 passengers. She had a crew of about 300. She made her first trip across the Atlantic Ocean in October 1903. Shortly after this maiden voyage, the Dominion Line was acquired by the White Star Line, and Columbus was repainted and renamed Republic. The renamed vessel was eventually transferred to the New York to Mediterranean service. When Jack Robinson Binns boarded the Republic as its radio officer, he was not expecting to be the savior of 1,600 lives. But Binns was just the right man for the job. As a boy, Binns was an orphan with a curiosity for technology. At age 14, acting as a railroad messenger, his foot was mangled by a train car, which required almost six months of bed rest to recover. It was during this time that Binns was able to study and educate himself and, most importantly, learn the telegraph. By his late teens, Binns was a pro and was recruited by the Marconi Wireless Company. He was now so skilled at the telegraph that he was able to complete the 10-month training course in only three months. Part of how the Marconi Wireless Company worked is they would train their Marconi men to use the machines and then position them where they were needed around the world. One place the Marconi Company loved to place its radio operators was, unsurprisingly, aboard ocean-going vessels. Early in his career, Binz was aboard some of the most famous German ships of this era, including the Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse and the Augusta Victoria. Binz never expected his job to require more than the ability to send passengers' messages back and forth to the land and keep the ship updated with news from the shore. Using a Marconi telegraph for any sort of safety purposes was still unheard of. Keep in mind, this technology was brand new and the use of wireless to aid in the rescue of a sinking ship hadn't happened yet. In 1908, the German Reichstag banned all non-German radio officers from German ships, disrupting Bin's work and career. He was eventually placed on an older British ship, the White Star Line's RMS Republic, where he continued on with his work in peace. Every day, he would receive incoming news and messages for the passengers and crew, and in return, tap out the outgoing mail. Day by day, he served the Republic as a loyal Marconi man. Just a few weeks after Binz began on Republic, a seemingly unrelated earthquake occurred in Sicily, some 2,000 miles away. This 7.1 magnitude earthquake would lead to the deaths of over 70,000 people and was a humanitarian disaster. 
As such, thousands fled this area of the world for a fresh start, away from the carnage and destruction. By January, a large mass of refugees had boarded the Italian liner SS Florida. Florida was launched for the Lloyd Italiano of Genoa, Italy in 1905 and had its maiden voyage in September of that year. The ship was just 380 feet long and weighed only 5,018 gross registered tons. The ship could reach a maximum speed of 14 knots and had two masts and two funnels. On the morning of January 23, 1909, the Florida was sailing on her usual route from Genoa to New York with a stopover in Palermo to pick up refugees. Florida was carrying just 13 first class and 826 steerage passengers alongside her crew. It was in the early hours of the day that the Florida would encounter a bank of fog. Coincidentally, the RMS Republic was sailing in a fog bank bound for Gibraltar. The steerage of Republic carried 211, of whom approximately 150 or so were homeward bound Italians whose relatives had suffered in the earthquake. Many were making the voyage to find out if their loved ones were even still alive, as communication out of the area was scarce at best. It was at 5.47 a.m. that the two ships would meet for the first time. Gashing a hole in the side of Republic and bending its own bow in, the Florida separated and disappeared into the fog. Now the Republic was, like most modern ships of the era, equipped with watertight bulkheads to aid in the event of a sinking. The impact from Florida was so severe, however, that the quadruple expansion engine inside of Republic came loose and smashed into a bulkhead which separated the two engine compartments. Her watertight doors were essentially destroyed and both engine compartments began to flood. The crew, thinking quickly, shut down Republic's boilers immediately to prevent an explosion. This move saved Republic from a boiler explosion, but without steam for her boilers, Republic was left without any power. Emergency lighting was not available. The ship, with many of her interior spaces lacking external lighting, was plunged into complete darkness. The ships drifted apart from each other, both being lost in the fog. Sealby ordered his ship sounded for damage and instructed Jack Binns to radio to other ships about their situation. At this time, Binns realized his equipment had been badly damaged in the crash. The wireless office was right where the Florida had hit. As the lone radio operator on board the Republic, he knew it was up to him in this moment. Let's review the situation the Republic is in. The ship has just been struck by a mystery vessel which has now disappeared. She has no power and is taking on water. There are 1,200 passengers aboard. They're far from land. The Marconi Room, or the area where the Marconi Room was, is a freezing cold hole in the side of the superstructure as it was ripped away and exposed to the environment. Binns knows he is the only hope of contacting the outside world. Luckily, the ship was equipped with backup battery power, not to power the lights or the lifeboat davits like on modern ships. These batteries were specifically put aboard to run the Marconi system. Now would begin a time of trial and error for Binns. He would tinker away at his telegraph device, just as he had done as a boy laid up in the hospital. He was at last finally able to restore power to his Marconi device and immediately began to send out the recognized distress signal using Morse code. CQD. CQ, or Seeking You, being a call for any ships or land-based radio operators, and the D being the signal for distress or danger. CQD, CQD, here is MKC. MKC shipwrecked, Republic rammed by unknown steamship, 26 miles southwest of Nantucket Lightship, badly in need of assistance, Sealby. The CQD call had never officially been sent before, the walls of the wireless room were caved in, and Bin's equipment was damaged. He had to hold up the heavy power switch for the system with one hand, while tapping out the message in the other. In Massachusetts, the Sconset Marconi station picked up the weak signal Bin's was putting out on Republic. Operator Jack Irwin immediately began to relay the news of the sinking. Help was on the way, but they would have to hurry to reach the ship before the time it foundered. The ship was estimated to be sinking at approximately one foot per hour. The engine and boiler rooms on Republic were flooding. 
and the ship started to list towards the gash in her hull. A listing ship makes launching lifeboats extremely difficult. While the ship was sinking slowly, the heatless, powerless ship was a less than ideal situation for passengers. The brunt of the crash was in the upper decks, right where many first and second class passenger cabins were located. Almost everyone aboard the ship was awoken by the crash and proceeded to venture out into dark corridors and up onto deck. Children wept in the darkness as families struggled to stay together. Some women were not afraid to don trousers or men's shoes in the rush of it all. Certainly taboo for the time. Captain Sealby led the crew in calmly organizing the passengers on deck for evacuation. They supplied coffee and blankets while they assured the passengers that rescue was on the way. It was around 7 a.m., nearly an hour after the collision, that another ship appeared from the fog. And for a moment, there was relief aboard. But wait, this wasn't another ship. This was the SS Florida. As a result of the collision with the Republic, its bow had been crushed back to a collision bulkhead. Three of her crewmen were killed in the crash, but as luck would have it for the passengers and crew on board, the Florida was not in danger of sinking. Sealby realized he could transfer his passengers to the Florida and get them out of harm's way, at least in the short term. The crew prepared to lower Republic's lifeboats and, in accordance with customs of the time, lowered women and children away first, then lowering the first class men, and so on. So it began, the transfer of 1,200 people from the sinking Republic to the Florida. Florida wasn't sinking, but with 900 Italian immigrants already on board. This left the ship already pretty full. The passengers aboard were beginning to panic, not understanding what was happening. They were likely traumatized from the earthquake, and when the ship slammed into Republic, figured disaster was imminent. Some sources say the crew of the Florida had to draw firearms to get the crowd under control. But regardless, the crew of the Florida prepared to board the passengers and crew of the much larger Republic. Binns did not evacuate. He knew he had a job to do. So there he sat, in the freezing cold, pitch black ship, working off of battery power to call for help from other ships. For over 12 hours, the Florida stood by the slowly sinking Republic. Her crew and passengers took to the lifeboats and back and forth they rode. As the Florida was loaded up more and more, the likelihood of sinking increased until finally, a savior arrived. A small US cutter named the Gresham arrived in the mid morning. Now, while Gresham was assigned help was coming, she was not large enough to save all involved on either ship. It would take a larger vessel to truly make a difference. Binns was still racing against the clock to get the passengers to safety. The RMS Baltic had arrived in the vicinity, but due to the fog was unable to locate Republic. Both Republic and Baltic shot rockets off into the air to try to locate each other. The Baltic was large enough to save all involved, if only she could find the ship in time. It was the same issue that plagued Republic earlier. In fog, a horn blast is distorted and hard to locate the direction of. Baltic and Republic would fire off rockets and blast their horns while Binns and Baltic's radio operators tried to tap helm directions to each other. Trying to find an exact position in the fog was nearly impossible before radar, leaving the Baltic to sail in a zigzag pattern to find Republic. Could Baltic reach Republic before she sank?
day, Ben stood by his post. The Baltic was out of rockets, and the sun was setting. But finally, it happened. Meanwhile, on land, regional radio operators began to listen to Sconset organizing the rescue of the Republic, and word spread of the sinking White Star Liner. Suddenly, wireless telegraphs all along the East Coast were buzzing, looking for news of the sinking. This further complicated the communication between Baltic, Republic, and Sconset. It wasn't until around 7 p.m., 13 hours after the initial collision, that the Baltic would emerge from the fog. There was a sense of relief for all aboard all ships, except for the crew of the Republic, who had to row the Republic's complement back over to the Baltic. As was customary, women and children were taken off first. Then the original first-class men of Republic were transferred. A riot almost erupted from the Italian immigrants when they were made to be the last to go aboard the Baltic. Order was maintained and the Baltic steamed for New York. The sinking of the Republic was not the savage fight for survival that most people think of when they think of a White Star Line ship sinking. The sinking was so orderly, in fact, that the officers of the Republic had to publicly come out and say that passengers should not have complained because their baggage had not been transferred to the Baltic. They said the work of transferring the Republic's passengers to the Florida and then to the Baltic had exhausted the crew of the Republic and it would have been physically impossible for them to have moved baggage at such a time. This is in contemporary newspapers. The Florida, relieved of its burden, was able to ride higher in the water and limp back to New York Harbor. The Republic was not so lucky. The Gresham attempted to tow Republic back to shore, but the next day, the ship succumbed to her wounds and sank by the stern. Bins, aboard Baltic, made sure to tap out one final message. White Star Line, New York. Republic sunk. All hands saved. Sealby. An official inquiry into the collision never took place, possibly due to the Republic carrying a valuable cargo of gold. Yes, the reason why the Republic has not been forgotten to history is due to her potentially large reserve of gold that sank on board. It's theorized that potential revelation of its loss could have triggered a minor financial crisis. Vague reports suggesting the gold was either US battleship fleet payroll or relief for the Messina earthquake victims persist for decades. The treasure, described as $3 million in American gold eagles, could now be valued at over $1 billion. The amount of gold differs from source to source, and it has never been found on the wreck of the ship. The SS Florida would actually be repaired and sail for several more years after the incident. Also, according to this photo, her bow was entirely repaired in just 24 days, which is not bad. Despite the lack of an official inquiry, Binns was a proponent of requiring there be two Marconi operators aboard ships at all times to ensure accidents like this could have similar outcomes in the future. Unfortunately, his suggestion was rejected. The sinking of the Republic was, as far as the general public was concerned, as ideal as a shipwreck could be. The White Star Line was understandably upset about losing a ship, but their insurance would have paid out. Though five people died in the collision, the lack of any deaths due to the sinking was nothing short of a miracle, and it would have been an unmitigated disaster had it not been for Jack Benz, once an injured kid in the hospital studying radio, now a hero to almost 2,000 lives between Republic and Florida. And this was not missed by the public. There was a ticker tape parade for Bins in New York after the rescue. There was even a song written about him, and a short silent film made. Bins had reportedly felt like the public had missed the point of the sinking. After the incident, Bins moved to the RMS Baltic, the same ship which had rescued the Republic, and worked with Captain E.J. Smith, later of the RMS Olympic. Smith requested Bins for the crew of the RMS Olympic, but Bins had fallen in love, and retired from Marconi. Now living on land, he began at a new position at one of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers. Two days into his new career, the RMS Olympic sister ship, RMS Titanic, sank on its maiden voyage. 
The same number of lives Binns had saved on the collision of the Republic had perished on the Titanic. Binns would go on to spend much of his adult life in Canada and America, where he would become a pilot and an aircraft radio operator. He died peacefully at the age of 75 in 1959, 50 years after the sinking. White Star Commander Inman Seely, the man who saved almost every person aboard his ship, died in 1942, a resident of New Jersey. The wreck of the RMS Republic was discovered in 1981 and remains a popular destination for treasure hunters looking to find her lost gold. And there you have it, the sinking of the RMS Republic. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe. If you would like to see a ship or historical event covered, leave a comment below. Have a great day.